My Lord is Most Merciful and Compassionate Part 1. A book in English responds to the doubters over the mercy of Allah, the Creator, and those who ascribe to Him some qualities that do not befit His perfection and majesty like cruelty and unfairness. It underlines that Allah's love for His servants is different from the love humans have for each other because their concept of love is an either loving person seeks and finds in the Beloved but Allah is free from that. His love for us is due to His generosity, kindness, and mercy. These misconceptions will be refuted by narrating some realistic situations, based on dialogue and arguing with wisdom. We feed you only for the countenance of God. In the first two years of our stay in Lagos, Nigeria, we lived in hotel apartments so that it would be easy for us to look for a suitable house near the kids' schools. Usually, after I returned from any trip, I was keen to bring simple presents for all janitors and the workers, and share with them food and drinks. At that time, spreading the word of Islam, Dua, was not in my mind, my intention was only to get close to God by giving gifts. When we decided to leave that place to move on to the new house, we were surprised that everyone in the area was crying. The driver told us that they have never met a Muslim family of such high manners who spread the spirit of love and fraternity and wanted to reward us. After hearing that from the driver, I had two thoughts. Should I feel good that we made their hearts happy? Or should I feel sad about the condition that the Muslims are in, which gave the people of that country such a bad impression about Muslim people in general? I told the driver that we already got our reward which was their happiness, and I then remembered the verse, We only feed you for the sake of God. We want from you neither compensation, nor gratitude Quran 76, 9, so I got relieved. They conceal within themselves that they only feed them for the pleasure of Allah, not intending to receive any recompense from those whom they have fed, nor any praise. Quran 76, 9 My mercy encompasses all things. I remember the story of the French language teacher. She was an African from a country called Benin which was adjacent to Lagos where we stayed. After the lecture, I told her that I needed a housemaid who could speak French, for my kids and I could practice the French language with her. I was surprised when she replied to me, I am ready to work for you. I told her, you are my teacher, and you have my all respect. She said, you are very kind, but I am really in need of this job. You know that I come from Benin adjacent to this city, and I need a place to stay. I will clean the house for you at morning, and work in the center at evening. Also, I noticed that you are very friendly even though your holy book, Quran, never talked about love, nor even about the love of the Creator to his servants. How can he love them while he tests them and restricts his provision? I reply to her, regarding the place you need to stay in, you are welcome with no job and for free. We already have an annex for the workers, and you can share the dorms with them. Regarding what you've said about the Quran, have you ever read the Quran? She replied, no, but I have heard about it. I told her, if you read the Quran, you will see what is mentioned in it about the mercy and love God has for his servants. But God's love to his servants is different from the love humans have with each other because love in humans' case is a need that the loving person seeks and finds in the beloved. But God does not need us, humans. Hence, his love for us is out of generosity, kindness and mercy. The love coming from the powerful to the powerless, coming from the free of need to the needy. The love coming from the competent and mighty to the helpless, coming from the most great to the humble. The love which comes with sagacity and wisdom. She asked, how come? I replied, wouldn't you bring your child to the operation room to have his her stomach opened? Wouldn't you fully trust the doctor's insight, his love to your baby, and his consideration to save him her from the illness? She replied, how come he loves his creations while he limits their freedom and doesn't permit them to do whatever they like to do? Have you never heard about individualism? Have you ever heard about this evolving concept, which means that the individual's decisions should be based on their benefits and pleasures? The individual is the focus of attention, so the individual's interests should be above the nation's considerations and above the society's and religion's effects. Besides, people should not be prohibited to gender transition, they should be able to do whatever they like to do and wear and behave in public in the way they want to, as the street is everyone's. I said, do you allow your children to do whatever they wish because you love them? Would you let your little son to jump out of the window or to play with an electric cord? I also told her, your statement where you said that the street is everyone's is correct, but your understanding of it is wrong. If you were living with a group of people in the same house, would you ever accept one of the house members to urinate in the hall, on the same concept that the house belongs to everyone? Would you ever accept living in this house with no laws and rules to govern it? A human who has complete freedom becomes an ugly being, as it has been unquestionably proven that the human is unable to handle this kind of freedom. Individualism can never take the place of collectivism regardless of the individual's power or influence. Community members are classes that cannot survive without each other and can never be independent. Some of them are soldiers, doctors, nurses, and judges. How can any of them outweigh their benefit and personal interest over others to achieve their happiness and be the focus of attention? She said, how can we achieve happiness then? 
I replied, the meaning of happiness in individualism is victory, domination, and the possession of technology. But in Islam, true happiness is a content heart, a successful marriage, a spacious house, a good neighbor, and a comfortable vehicle, with sharing and cooperation. Although the Islamic civilization was formed by a mixture of different people and tribes, it produced accountability and reward systems, along with duties and rights. The person is punished for his crimes, but he is also rewarded in other cases. Islam liberated the individual from his previous prejudices and led him to his pure inner self to live like an honest, social civil who lives in a community, respects its laws, and appreciates his intellectual potential along with his ability to coexist beautifully with others. A nation that aspires to progress and builds a higher goal emerges from the concept of a single identity. Everyone has their ideas and capabilities, but applying these ideas requires teamwork, and thus everyone is equal with whatever they present. So, Islam has presented the perfect relationship of the individual with his society. I proceeded, the individual is only a small and integral part of society. This makes a peaceful and secure society because if the balance between classes is disturbed, conflicts will arise, and it will lead to dissatisfaction in society. Money is no longer the highest standard that distinguishes its owner from others, nor the power or leadership of the world is recognized because of money. The leader in the Islamic government is not evaluated by the money he possesses. Still, by the knowledge, morals, and justice he has, and these were the qualities with which they were able to advance and achieve victories one after the other. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, the example of the believers regarding mutual love, affection, and fellow feeling, consists of one body. When any limb of it aches, the whole body aches, because of sleeplessness and fever. Narrated by Muslim. She said, individuality is directly related to homosexuality, so why do you not like homosexuals? Their tendencies are a natural genetic issue and tendency, and we must respect them. As I know, it is a natural genetic issue, and we must respect it. I said to her, would you respect a thief's tendency to steal? It is an inclination to, but in both cases, it is an abnormal proclivity. It's against the human instinct, and aggression against nature, it should be rectified. God created the human and guided him on the right path. He also gave him free will to choose between the path of righteousness and the way of evil. And we showed him the two ways. And I made the paths of goodness and evils known to him. Quran, 90-10. So, we find that homosexuality was rarely seen in the societies which prohibit it. At the same time, the percentage of homosexuals is high in the ambient which permits and encourages such a behavior. The surrounding ambient and teachings determine the probability of one to be homosexual. God glory be to him said about the people of Prophet Lot peace be upon him. Allah sent Lot to his people to call them to believe in the oneness of Allah and to stop them from rebelling against him. He said, do you commit such a forbidden and shameful act of sodomy, when no one before you has committed such a crime? Do you go to men to satisfy your lust instead of women, who you are supposed to go to? Then in that case you have not followed sense or any sound report or even what is natural. Rather you have gone beyond the limits of Allah, overstepping the bounds of moderation, good sense and the natural nobility of humankind. His people, who committed this shameless wrong which they had been forbidden from doing, only responded by turning away from the truth, saying, drive Lot and his followers out of your city. They are a people who have kept away from this action of ours, so it is not befitting that they stay living here among us. Quran, 7, 80-82 This verse assures that homosexuality is neither inherited nor relates to genetic code composition, for the people of Prophet Lot were the first to innovate such an obscenity. This is in line with an eminent scientific study which ensures that homosexuality has nothing to do with inherited. The identity of a human being is continually changing. For example, it could change according to their watch channels, use technologies, or the liking for a soccer team, as globalization made him or her so complicated. A betrayer is now portrayed as someone with a point of view. A homosexual is described as a normal behaving person, who thoroughly enjoys legal rights that enabled him or her to participate in public debates. Also, it is assumed that we must advocate him or her and strengthen ties too. Superiority now is for the technology holder. Hence, if a homosexual has the power sources, technology, he or she will surely pass his convictions, this caused spoilage in the relation of the human being, society, and the creator. By a direct correlation among individualism and homosexuality, human nature, which human beings belong to, is dispersed. And the family's concepts were dropped. From the article on the concept of absolute individuality and the individual in the nation, written by, Marwad Sabak, Owatan newspaper. Then, the Western started setting up resolutions to get rid of individualism. This is because keeping this perception will undoubtedly cause the loss of the accomplishments modern man has achieved, the same way it will cause the failure of the notion of family. So, 
Till now, the Westerns have been suffering from a population decrease, which has led to attracting immigrants. Believing in God and respecting the divine laws he created for us, as well as the determination to following his instructions and avoiding wrong deeds, is the way to happiness in the worldly life and the hereafter. And never has the gift of your Lord been restricted. My teacher ended her conversation by telling me, how do non-religious countries develop and religious countries go down although God loves the latter, religious countries. I said, does the school headmaster reward his son who failed with a success certificate because he is his son? Some rules and norms must be followed, and on that basis of these sets, we define who succeeds and who fails. However, this does not affect the fact that the headmaster loves his son more than anyone else. Indeed, he, the son, is who carries his name and will be his only heir. I also told her, the universe is just like a school, it has its laws and norms. The disbelievers achieved the materialistic and technological progress because they applied the universal laws and the divine norms to establish good political systems and robust educational and pedagogical systems with methodological standards. This materialistic progress is only for those who apply the divine norms and the universal laws, this proves that the worldly success doesn't favor a white or a black. Justice is one of God's names and injustice is one of the ugliest acts God warned us, humans, from committing. But a disbeliever still won't be given the reward of the hereafter which is only for God's servants and lovers. The messenger of God peace be upon him said, God does not wrong a believer a good deed as he is given blessing for it in this world and will be rewarded for it in the hereafter. But the disbeliever is given in the world the reward for good deeds, he has performed and when he comes to the hereafter, there is no good deeds for which he can be rewarded. Hadith Muslim number 2162 God Almighty gives them what they deserve in this world, considering what they have of goodness and what they exert of justice. God, glory be to him, may support a nation of disbelievers over a Muslim nation as a punishment for its sins, just like what happened in the Battle of Uhud. Allah kept the promise he gave you of victory over your enemies on the day of Uhud, when you were engaging them in battle, by Allah's permission. Until you became weaker in your resolve to do as the messenger had commanded you, and you disagreed about whether to stay at your posts or leave them in order to obtain the gains of war. You disobeyed the messenger's command to stay at your positions no matter what may happen. This occurred after Allah showed you the victory over your enemies that you wanted so much. Among you are those who desire the goods of this world, and it was those who left their positions. And among you are those who desire the reward of the afterlife, and it was those who stayed at their positions, obeying the messenger's command. Then Allah turned you away from them and gave them power over you so as to test you, and to make clear who are the believers who were patient with trials and who were those who abandoned their positions and became weak. Allah has indeed forgiven you for what you committed when you went against the messenger's command, and Allah's grace for the believers is great, guiding them to faith, forgiving their disobedience, and rewarding them for the difficulties they go through. Quran 3, 152 The Messenger of God said, God Almighty shared out your character between you as he divided provision between you. God Almighty bestows wealth on those he loves and those he does not love. He only gives faith to those he loves. Hadith Bukhari in Adad al-Mufrad she replied, well if I believe in him right now, will he make me wealthy and give me a house? I said, if your father didn't make you wealthy or give you a house, would you deny his existence? God is waiting for us. There is a beautiful story about a group of Chinese atheists who were wondering about God's mercy. One of them asked, how come the creator gives us instincts, then after that, he asks us not to use them? How come he gives us money, and after that, he asks us to lose it by giving it to charities? How come he gives us time and then he asks us to waste it in worship? Isn't that a proof of his cruelty? I replied to him, that means you believe in him, but you just question whether he is merciful or not? He said, no, I don't believe in him because he is cruel. I said to him, your assumption that he is cruel is just itself evidence that he exists. Sorry, but you are contradicting yourself. God is above from being unjust or evil. He is the merciful compassionate, his mercy is the absolute mercy. Anyways, the cruelty you assume is not evidence against God's existence, but it's against whether he is merciful or not. I also told him, when you wish to release your instincts, you tend to be a slave to them, instincts. Yet, God wants you to become a master over them. He wants you to be a reasonable, wise person who manages his instincts. At the same time, you are not supposed to restrict them. It is better to direct them towards upgrading your soul and elevating yourself. I asked him, do you have children? He said, yes. I said, if you obligate your children to devote some time to study to have an honorable intellectual rank in the future, while the children's desire is just to play, are you considered an oppressive father? I was sincerely astonished, seeing the group fly from excitement about my response.
Then, one of them asked me, what can we do now, considering that we have been distanced from God a lot? Will he forgive us if we came back? We have offended him a lot. I told him, you just offended yourselves. God, the Almighty does not need us, but we need him. Anyway, what would you do if your disobedient son stayed away from you? Would you make him feel ashamed? Would you ask him to shoot himself? He replied, I would keep waiting for him to come back, and pardon him if he came. I told him, so, God is waiting for you now. He burst into excitement and chanted loudly, God is waiting for us. He chanted again. Then everyone turned to each other saying, God is waiting for us. God's messenger, Muhammad, peace be upon him said, God is more pleased with the repentance of his servant than any one of you who loses his riding beast in a barren land while it was carrying his food and drink. He despairs of ever finding it, so he comes to a tree and lies down in its shade, having given up all hope of finding his beast that he rides, then whilst he is there like that. Suddenly he sees it standing near him, so he takes hold of its reins and because of his great joy he says, O oh God, you are my slave, and I am your Lord, i.e. He makes a mistake because of his great joy. Narrated by Bukhari I also remember a personal experience I witnessed with a famous Indian actor who has converted to Hinduism so far. We discussed the mercy of God and his affection towards his servants. One of them asked, How come God sometimes depicts himself as the forgiving and the merciful, yet he becomes the severely punishing? I replied, God is forgiving and merciful with those whose sins are committed without persistence because of their weak human character. He is also forgiving for the sins that do not intend to defy the Creator, Allah. Indeed, the Almighty destroys. The one who defies him and denies his existence, he also destroys the one who draws him in the form of an idol or an animal. I was then inappropriately interrupted by the actor. He said, these are minor issues that God doesn't care about. I told him, if you insult an animal, no one can blame you, but if you insult your parents, you'll be reprimanded severely. Don't look how small the sin is but look to the greatness of whom you disobeyed. Then follow me so that God will love you. I had one of the most challenging experiences with two Christian South African siblings, and the brother's wife, who was a Buddhist Thai. The woman and her brother were white South Africans, and they were remarkably tall and massive, while the brother's wife was very short and tiny. I was confused at first by the differences in the heights, the body frames, and the visitors' beliefs. I was supposed to start my conversation with them by a short presentation about Islam. Instead, I was surprised with the fluency of non-stop talking by the South African woman, she barely gave me a chance to utter one word. She kept saying, God is love. God loves you. God died for you. I then held myself up and said to her, All right. I'm ready to embrace Christianity if you answered my questions. The visitor cheered up, and she went to bring her sister-in-law to let her listen to our conversation. She was in another corner of the mosque, taking pictures. I understood that the South African lady had been trying to convince her Buddhist sister-in-law to convert to Christianity since a long time. And she thought that if I accept converting to Christianity, it would be a motivation for her sister-in-law to do the same. In the presence of her sister-in-law, the visitor said to me, Well, I'm ready, tell me your questions. I said to her, You said that God loves me and that he died to forgive my sins. She said, Yes, that's right. I asked, Would the love I have for my son make me kill myself to forgive his sins? With all his love for me, is God unable to forgive me if I just repent and turn back to him? Can the love God has for me make him punish me for a sin committed by someone else, Adam's sin, and then grant me salvation just if I believed in the death of another person on a cross? Not for my good deeds? Was God with all his love to Jesus unable to protect him from killing and crucifixion? How come God may die when he is ever living and does not die in your creed? Isn't this a contradiction? According to what you believe, when God died for three days, who was managing the universe in his claimed absence? Who gave the provisions, lives and caused death? God is omnipotent, does it suit his majesty to be fixed to a wooden beam? To be tortured to death as you claim, especially that the crucified person is considered cursed in your book. In which chapter in your book, did Jesus say that he is God? When Jesus cried and prayed to God for help when they wanted to crucify him, did he pray to himself? Exalted is God, God the Almighty is high above what they say. And, for, they're saying, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But, another, was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. And they did not kill him, for certain. Rather, Allah raised him to himself. And ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. Quran 4, 157-158 God is perfect, he does not need to die for us. He gives life and death, so he did not die, nor was he resurrected.
He saved his prophet Jesus and protected him as he helps and protects his chosen believers. Then we will save our messengers and those who have believed. Thus, it is an obligation upon us that we save the believers. Quran 10, 103 As I was asking my questions, I noticed her confusion, fret, and peeping gazes to her sister-in-law, and I felt that she got worried from the influence of my talk on her sister-in-law. So, she told me that she is in a hurry, and without replying to any of my questions she said to me, I liked your dress so much, then she hugged me tightly to the point that I was frightened. She then grabbed her sister-in-law's hand and left the mosque right away. I also remember facing a similar situation with a religious Christian, a French man. He said to me, God loves you, he died for you. I asked him, who told you that? God himself or Jesus? He replied, Saint Paul did. He was a smart and educated man. His educational level was the same level as a person who holds three doctorates in our time. I said, what is the relation between Paul's educational level and the divine revelation? He told me, he saw a vision telling him that the Almighty God died for us. I told him, the divine revelation comes from God, including the revelation descending with the divine messages. On the other hand, it's the devilish revelation that comes in the form of dreams to humans. He laughed at my response. I proceeded, human knowledge is a human production that is subjected to correctness and error. It includes scientific achievement or inspiring literature, and it has nothing to do with divine revelation. Finally, I told him, I do not have much information on this point. But I am shocked from a person who leaves the right message of the Messiah which is a divine revelation and goes for a vision of a person who had never met the Messiah during his life such as Paul. And that is just because he is educated. This is insensible and is in all means opposing to both instinct and rationale. Paul was one of the Messiah's worst enemies who tried to destroy his religion, kill him, and torment his followers. I continued, for me, as a person who loves the Messiah, I must believe in his message. In your book, the Messiah said, God is only one God. Mark 12 29. Saint Paul said, 3 in 1. Corinthians 12 3 to 6. In your book, the Messiah said, I ascend on to my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. John 17 20. Paul said, the Messiah is the only begotten Son of God. Galatians 4, 4 comma 5. In your book, the Messiah said, that I do nothing of myself. John 35. Paul said, Jesus is omnipotent. John 5:15. In your book, the Messiah said, my father is greater than I. John 28, 14. Paul said, God, in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 3, 1. So please tell me, whom shall I believe now the Messiah or Paul? The French visitor said, you know all that and you claim that you don't have any information. Would you allow me to take some photos because I have a necessary appointment to go to? I told him, please do.